So this is going to be a panel discussion about um, uh, concerns of opening research data. And uh, most of the people in this room, I guess, share the idea that uh, open data and open science is good. And that's something that we should promote. And that public access to research data has numerous benefits and, and advantages for the scientific community and the society, wider society. While this mandated public data archiving is becoming kind of a, a norm in the science, we still have uh, uh, lots of research data that are not published or not made uh, openly accessible. So it seems that we scientists and the scientific community by and large, we are not fully ready uh, for uh, opening data. Judge from the mere fact that most of our research data are not either open or if open, they are archived in a way that partially or entirely prevent the reuse. So these are the issues that we are going to discuss. We have something like 25 minutes time, so very tight schedule. So I will skip the introduction of the two of the panel members that have already been um, introduced to you, Mikael and Niklas, but then we have a pleasure to have uh, Emma Mat Watka, uh, who is an animal ecologist and postdoctoral researcher at the Department of Biology in the University of Oulu. And then we have Santeri Laurila, who is a PhD student at the Helsinki Institute of Physics working on particle physics. So today we do so that each of the panel members will first tell what she or he thinks is the main or prime obstacle for opening data and what should be done in order to remove that obstacle. And I guess we, because one of the ideas here is to uh, give opportunity to younger generation scientists to uh, speak up and present their uh, opinions, I will give first uh, uh, opportunity to Emma, please. Thank you. So good afternoon, everybody. My name is Emma Vatka. I come from the University of Oulu. I work in a research group that maintains long-term programs for, for collecting uh, data, of uh, demographic data of breeding birds. So the data at the moment is not open access, or part of it is, but mostly it, it is not. But this does not mean that we will not be willing to share the data. It is a common practice in our field that data is available upon request. So researchers ask us for our data and we usually reply positively and share our data. And this culture is based on mutual benefits. So we share our data and we are able to access their data as well. And when the data is used, also the data provider is mentioned as an author in, in the publications. So we get benefits from sharing the data. In a way, I'm here in a, um, I have a dual role here. Um, on one hand, I'm a new generation scientist who would definitely benefit from open access of the research data. And on the other, other hand, I'm working in a research group that, that has long-term data that is not easy to push open access. Um, one of my main concerns, well, uh, I listened to Sverker Helmgren's uh, presentation, and he presented many issues that researchers have well, they have negative attitudes toward opening research data, and I recognize man many of those. Um, one of the main issues is that, well, I at least in our research field, collecting data, producing data, is not cost-free. It takes a lot of effort to produce the data. It takes time, and also it takes money. So some researchers are paying the costs of producing data, and then they are asked to put it open so that others can benefit from it. And 
I think many researchers in, in our field do, do not find this fair, that some are paying the cost and others are benefiting from it. My solution for this pro 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 problem, well, I mentioned mutual benefits. So if researchers who provide the data could be given benefits from it, for example, co-authorship in papers where the pa data is used, that would be a solution, in my opinion. Okay, thank you, Emma. We move on, and then we hopefully have uh, time for discussion and questions from the audience. But next, Sandari, please. Thank you. <coughs> Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, so I'm an experimental particle physicist. I'm a PhD student in the University of Helsinki. Uh, and uh, I'm in a kind of fortunate position in here because in, in the field of high energy physics uh, we have uh, well established, I would say, open access policies and institutions already existing. Uh, simply because uh, we are doing this kind of very basic research which is, which is publicly funded uh, and that means that uh, in a way, we, we have an obligation to, to some point to make the data public to benefit everybody. Uh, and uh, so I'm working for the CMS collaboration, which is a collaboration of 3,000 members, approximately. Uh, and we have uh, actually people who are full-time working only for publishing the data and making sure that it gets... Uh, to be public, and we, we also, uh, all our publications are open access and so on. Uh, so I don't, as a researcher, I don't have to myself really much fight for this or anything. Uh, but the problems that uh, have been mentioned here are, uh, some of them are really relevant for us. And of course, one is, uh, I would also like to talk a bit about this, like, effort of gathering the data. And of course, the researchers who keep up the experiments and uh, spend lots of time and, and money on gathering the data want to get their hands to the date of thirst. And, and this, is, this is also my solution, basically, that, uh, and the solution that has been adopted uh, by the large collaborations at CERN, that uh, let's give a few years, let's say, for the people who have paid for the, like mostly the institutions that have paid for the gathering the data and done all the work to play with the data and analyze it and then after that let's make it public to everybody so that basically any one of you can now download data from the particle physics experiments from 2010 or 11 and learn how to play with it and see if you find out something interesting. Uh, another good point here is that the data itself doesn't help very much but you also you have to know how to use it, how to interpret what's in there, what were the conditions uh, where the data was taken, what kind of corrections you should use. So all of this very different metadata is also needed. And also for this, I think, it's kind of optimal to, you have kind of optimal time window to make the data open access so that the researchers uh, are not very busy anymore working on the data themselves. They understand it, they know how it should be used and they can kind of, they can help in, uh, uh, in making it open access so that all this metadata will be correctly added. Uh, but at the same time, people still remember how this data was taken, what, what, what was done uh, at the time of data taking and that's also important. Uh, Yes, and luckily also just, uh, I guess that birds are not very concerned about their privacy and also protons and electrons are not very concerned about their privacy, so that makes life easy for us. Okay, thanks Sangdari for providing a different perspective from, uh, from physics and now we move on and it's uh, Mikael's turn. Yeah, uh, <laughs> well, it's, um, it's very complicated to say you know, what is the main obstacle for, for making data open? I think it's, there are many different things. Um, but one thing I would like to elaborate on, which I touch upon a bit in my presentation, is related to, to training and information and knowledge, for, you know, that our researchers should have about these issues. So, 
this meeting I had with, uh, with Markus Herga from uh, Biosustain, which is a research center, a huge research center at DGU. He, he works in, you know, he, he says, like, there is not a big problem if you have a clear strategy. And that's the point, that you have to have some kind of thoughts about what you're doing when it comes to when can you share your data, when are you working on a pattern, when are you collaborating with industry. The problem is sometimes that it just gets like black and white. So like we have the tech transfer guy, we have the pattern guys who say like, yeah, no, nothing can be disclosed. You know, we never know what happened. You know, it could be a potential pattern or something like that. And they go out to, to talk to our researchers and they try to say like, you know, you should be really, really careful. You should be really careful all the time. And then we come from the library or for the research data management office and say like, you know, uh, you know, you have to make your data open as well. So we have to have a more coherent way of discussing these things and saying, well, it's not black and white. And I like the way that was presented today earlier in one of the presentations saying, you know, open science is an ideal and it will never be perfect. And that we have to remember all the time. So don't be sort of an open science purist, you know, you, you know, balance the different stakeholder, balance the different um, interests that there, there is in this field. Uh, and then I think we can succeed uh, making as much as possible open. Thanks, Mikhail. And finally, Niklas, please. Thank you. Yes. Um, maybe th the uh, biggest issue, I think, is the cultural change currently. currently. But if we go past that and uh, we get the research community and we get the, the researchers get their carrots, so they, they want to do this. I think after that, uh, the fair part of it, it's, uh, there's a problem there. We don't want the data to end up in black holes. Uh, we need to find them, uh, we need to access them, we need to, they need to be interoperable uh, and reusable. And the curation of the data, I think, is extremely important there. And there I see a large gap uh, at least in the life science research communities. Uh, describing your data in a way that's interoperable, not only for a human, but for a machine. There are so many data sets out there, and they're so big, it has to be machine uh, transferable. The, this data space has to work uh, uh, across by a computer. And for that, uh, things has have to be described in a concise way. And in, in biology, there are over 600 uh, standards, controlled vocabularies or ontologies. Currently, the researchers working on the floor, they're, they're not really interested in this. And they, when they are exposed with it, they, they just shake their head. Uh, so there's a gap there of that, that uh, uh, is about education and training a lot. But also, I think, about uh, lowering thresholds and uh, uh, having these persons that can help researchers navigate it. We've heard the term data stewards mentioned, and I think that's extremely important uh, for this to work. And I think Bernd Mons of the uh, Open European Science Cloud, he, he claims that Europe needs 500,000 data stewards maybe a bit much, but lower that figure by, by 10, 50,000. I mean, uh, and this needs, we need a shift. This money, it, it has to come, money has to be taken from somewhere. And, but so there has to be stair for this to work. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, from these introductory notes, it seems obvious to me that there are definitely differences between uh, scientific fails so that in the end, uh, perhaps we do not need to come up with a one set of rules and procedures for open science and open data, but kind of a field specific or as um, Mikael said, perhaps uh, department and faculty specific strategies for opening um, data and, and doing open science. Now we have some 10 minutes time for discussion, so I will give possibility for the audience to act, ask questions.
<coughs> I give the other the opportunity still to think while I'm speaking here. Uh, I, I think I, I was listening to, I was preparing my question and I was listening to the speakers or the panelists and I think I can summarize because some of the things came up, not the same by everybody, but uh, you could cover most of it. And I think uh, the first thing is that a data management plan is not a static one. It's, I mean, a data management plan cannot be done only in the beginning of a project. It's something which needs to be corrected during a project and after the project. Uh, the other thing is that the data management cost ecology isn't really there. Well, th there isn't really clearly defined who is going to pay this. And the research community still is very reluctant to put any money into it. So that's uh, another thing which has to be resolved. And the third thing is, if I don't know if Jean-Claude is still here, but he's using the slogan or saying that the researchers can't write met metadata. The research researchers can be paid to write crappy metadata. So who is going to write this metadata? Because it's definitely not the researchers. It could be the data practitioners, but we are lacking the 500,000 of them, so I don't know. So, in, in a way, the discussion which we are having here is too much circulating about around the individual researchers themselves, because I don't think the individual researchers themselves is the main core, or the main thing in reuse of data. We have to create some other supporting platforms or other supporting means because the researchers themselves will not solve this problem. Thank you. Who would like to comment on that? Well, I agree on that, you know, of course, doing new stuff needs funding. I mean, Ivo said today, I mean, sometimes it's also opportunity cost. It's a question whether do you want the external funding from Horizon 2020? If they have requirements, you have to invest into doing data management. I know it's a shift of way most researchers think about these things, but if you want strategically to win the money, you have to do the best possible way you can do data management in different projects. When I think about the discussion we had here today, I mean, maybe from, from the two... Uh, younger researchers, maybe it was more sort of a personal thing, but I think the other things we've discussed here about concerns about uh, providing uh, access to, to data was not so much personal things, it's more structural things about how universities think about what's important for them. And I think in this open science discussion, the way, the level it is at today is quite new. I mean, in Denmark, for the last 15 years, we've been just discussing like, how can we make research into you know, value for society, jobs, money, you know, this kind of thing. That's been the main issue. Actually, my office is being moved uh, before Christmas. I was sitting next to our, our vice director, but now I'm being moved down uh, to, to near the library because the vice director wants to have the business developer up next to him. So, I mean, even though we have the discussion here, we think open science is very important here today, it's not quite at the same height of interest at the universities yet. Yes, <clears throat> I completely agree that uh, this, like the main problems here are organizational and we should concentrate on that. And it's like, of course, it's very important that what like uh, open data minded researchers can do themselves, but of course it's very limited also because of uh, the nature of the, how the academic world, world works nowadays. So it's very, it, usually it consists of short projects. And when you change your project, you change maybe the, if not the institute, you change uh, what you work with and you change your computers and the data should be stored safely somewhere in the, let's say, in the upper level or the completely different uh, part of organization. So that uh, it's not dependent on whether that researcher who once did the, the study is available to help with the data or anything. So I agree completely about this. I, I think you're really uh, right at bringing out the, the data management plans and that they're not uh, static things. And I think we need to offer 
something to the researchers, a solution to their problems. Uh, offer them data management planning as a part that would make the, the project management easier. Because if you do things right from the beginning and do it regularly, your research would run easier. You will remember two down, months down the line what you actually did and so on. Uh, so I think if we can offer such a product, if you want to call it that, that is something that the researcher would want because it helps his uh, project. Uh, I think that's a way forward. And one question here. <coughs> well, I, I said it early on, that I think we made the, the, the researcher's mission quite impossible because now we want to press this open science onto them. We should, uh, we should uh, make the university leadership accept that if you really go for openness, which is a good idea, I believe, then you should really think through whether you should care so much about the ranking, if the ranking parameters are not changed, whether you should employ people in a different way with a different focus than just nature papers and so on. They should really move in there, otherwise there's no help for the scientists. I think they're pretty good stories. I mean, the, 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 the Hubble data, uh, more p uh, papers are written on the H Hubble data uh, by um, people who not make the data, but other people make the data. That the sharing there is really uh, uh, bang for the box. Um, I also know colleagues of Nicholas that were very proud that their, their tools and their, their uh, for, for reading this enormous amount of data, their tools for reading that are downloaded much more than their nature and science papers. They're really proud and, uh, and, and they So maybe we should have an age index for the data rather than a, a, a co-authorship <laughs> each time somebody uses the data. But, but it's going, it needs to come, cost money, first of all, and it needs to come from somewhere. Uh, and that's from the top. If you leave it on the scientists to change uh, the, the way they usually go about it, it's, it's unfair because they are not going to get funding, promotion, or anything. Okay, it seems um, that we largely agree that this uh, opening science and opening data is uh, institutional problems and we should have institutional solutions. But the solutions might differ between uh, institutions. Um, any further questions, comments? Um, <laughs> okay. Yeah, I, I don't want to dominate, but it's, uh, there are so many things uh, in, in, in the air. Uh, but while there are scientists or researchers in the audience, I, I would like to see a bit of reflections on, because I think before we can implement what we have been discussing during the day, we need uh, a persistent object identification system. I'm talking about object identification system because we don't have that for the time being. If we now request the scientists, the researchers to put their data and software somewhere, there is really no mechanism with we are going to find them in two years time because that's missing. That component is missing in the system. And uh, I Somehow, I, I don't really hear any worried voices or, or any comments about this. Because we, if sometimes we compare the situation with the data with the development of the internet in the 70s. And before we agreed to start using TCP IP to really start flushing the bits in the network, it, it was very, very complicated and we still lack some of the basic components. So any views on, on, on this? Okay, there was a question, so Mika. Well, I don't know how many of you have heard uh, Baron Mons, because uh, basically that's what he's saying, right, with the uh, European Open Science Cloud, is that we have to learn from, from, from the internet and from, the, from, from having these rules of engagement. That's basically what we want. We don't want to make standards, like 600 different standards, and that we should have like a central organization looking at different standards. We have to do like very simple rules of engagement for anyone who wants to participate in an open science infrastructure. I have no idea how that can happen at all, but I just heard 
that's what he said. And if someone can make that happen, I would be happy. But uh, <laughs> so that's my only. Okay. Um, one final question. We are running out of time, but um, one. Who's here? Okay, good. Thank you. Uh, my name is Paul Sörgård. I work in the Norwegian Ministry for Research, Research and Education, but before that I was an information system scientist, and, and it's actually the information system scientist who starts thinking now, because uh, really uh, I think what you were discussing a while ago is the issue of how to mobilize individuals here, how to motivate them and their incentives and all of that. And, and I think that's really the way to go, because this is a, an enormously difficult task to mobilize lots of researchers who are quite individualistic, and they have their careers and all of that. And, and, and if, you, if you're going to give them something that is sort of uh, negative or difficult for their careers, you, you, you won't make it. So, so, so the only way to do this is to turn this around and make it attractive for those who are going to make and curate and maintain these data. And, and uh, really, I, uh, I'd like to ask you a question. Have any of you five talked to the information systems researchers in your institutions about these issues? I can reply, I have not. <laughs> <laughs> not about these issues. <laughs> I've, I've discussed it with uh, the DTU Compute, which is a department for computer science. Those I've discussed it with, but they, have, they are pretty, you know, far-sighted when it comes to this open science and reproducibility of science. They are working on how can we store software, code, data, everything. They are really inspired by the whole discussion you find in Nature about the whole reproducibility crisis. So I mean, they are working on that. But the thing is, you cannot just copy one thing from one department for one discipline to another discipline. That's the problem. What we can do is that we can. You know, at the university, we can start discussions for all the departments and individually in each department, how can we do it within your field? That's the approach we are doing at TCU, is that we have a very general data management policy, which basically says data have to be fair, and if it can be openly available, it should be openly available, but, uh, you know, some other things as well. But that has to be implemented locally in the departments, and we have to have the discussion. And again, it's not going to be perfect, but we have to try. That's important. I've worked together with a lot of people who think that they can build the perfect system. And that's, you know, that's difficult. <laughs> Just a, I, I think the problem is you have to provide a carrot, the, a really juicy carrot. And I think maybe just to get good academic merit or credit, for publishing data and being showing that it is a quality data that you publish. That's what's going to change it. And that funders and universities see to this and not as much as, as how many Im high impact papers you, I think that's a very strong driver if we can get to there. Yes, uh, just a short comment. So actually this discussion to me, this is quite similar to the, like we would be discussing that that how to, how to ensure that the level of teaching is good in universities. I mean, teaching is something that is uh, usually seen as a harmful for your research and harmful for your scientific career and so on. Uh, but there are indeed universities which have managed to make the incentives such that, that they can have people who have a strong pedagogical background and strong scientific background in the specific field. And maybe similarly, to the question, who are the people? We probably we will need people who are strong in their own fields and uh, have uh, this broader data management uh, background as well. Okay, perhaps we can uh, end up. Okay, <laughs> just you said about the the we have a big juicy carrot. I think it's very important because we meet researchers now and then who actually see the light. They want to make the things open. They're asking for help. And we're all waiting for like to have the big carrot and have all the infrastructures and we can't help them. We're losing, we're losing them. They can be the future advocates, right? So jump in it, right? <laughs> okay, now it's time to end this, this panel discussion. I would like to thank all the panel uh, members for this uh, discussion and uh, perhaps we can end up
by perhaps with these fine, wise words and also the comments on the on the board that we need to change metrics. How do we measure people performance in our universities? That's the way to create incentives. Thanks.